world of green matters. This week, a mighty river in distress, the hazards of techno trash, and the humble earthworm goes to work in Chile. But first, our liquid gold, water. Seesawing between drought and deluge, Africa is a land where water is scarce. Women in Maasai communities bear the burden of collecting water. They often walk more than 10 kilometers daily, leaving home during the night to begin their long search, especially during times of drought. We used to wait the rain season, March and the month of March and April. And when it passed, the drought come. When the drought come, you see now the Maasai people starting looking for grass for their livestock, moving from place to place. And the women going to their long, walking long distances, 10 kilometers and over. However, these Maasai women in Kenya are now harvesting rainwater and collecting it in tanks, which has improved water supplies and done away with the daily trek to collect river water. A recent report compiled by the United Nations Environment Program and the World Agroforestry Centre cites water harvesting as a key, simple and cheap way for Africa to adapt to climate change and end water problems. The water table is not, is not um, quite sufficient. Two, it, it, it has short rains and it has frequent droughts and most of the times this water just run off. Like if it rains now, you'll find a big, you know, runoff. But after a few minutes it's gone, maybe to the ocean, I don't know. But should it be collected, it can be, more, it can be used to produce a lot of food that is enough for Kenya. Until recently, the importance of rainwater harvesting as a buffer against climate-linked extreme weather conditions has been ignored in water planning, with countries relying instead on rivers and underground supplies. Changing weather patterns, however, mean that these are increasingly unreliable. For many years, unpredictable rains, flash floods and prolonged drought have made it increasingly difficult for the Maasai to survive as nomadic pastoralists. So many today are looking at new ways of surviving by settling in one spot and with the new addition of rainwater harvesting tanks. Maasai women are able to diversify their livelihoods by developing small gardens, selling produce at the market and making beaded jewellery for additional income. Having water supplies on their doorstep has liberated the women, and even the Maasai men can testify to the benefits households gain from water collection. The water is very, very good. Because they already have a tank at their home, it can be used for cooking, for clothing, and for washing the children. So the women are comfortable and they save time. The Maasai traditional mud houses are also being adapted to cater for the rainwater harvesting technology. At least one house in the village will have to have an iron sheet roof so that rainwater can run off and be collected in tanks. The impact on lives and livelihoods is substantial. The Maasai women are no longer forced to trek four hours every day to fetch water, but also the water is clean, safe and uncontaminated. And the potential is there for many other African communities to benefit from the Maasai women's achievements. Quiet as a lamb? Not exactly. These little guys certainly make their presence known. They are Welsh sheep. Noisy, but very hardy. Native to Wales and its sometimes harsh environment, they are tough little animals with soft, pure fleece. Their wool is keenly sought after for a variety of uses. Farmer Nick Summerfield has been looking after sheep in these Welsh hills for more than 45 years. As you can see by the, by the uh, altitude and the aspect of the farm, it's a very, very hard, north-facing, high hill farm. So we're more or less committed to the indigenous native Welsh breed, which we've stuck to through the years, and they've done me very well. The strength and purity of Nick's wool has helped a small Welsh company realise its dream to produce truly organic bedding. Abaca produces organic mattresses, and an essential element is the wool, which has been washed and formed into luxurious sheets. 
The prefabricated mattress base is encased in the wool, the first step in a long and careful process to produce a wholly organic product. Handmade, chemical free, pesticide free, fungicide free. The difference is that we're not using any chemicals. So most, most materials that you'd see on the market have been treated with some sort of um, a fire retardant and the chemicals are above and beyond, it's, it's crazy. Um, we actually discovered that by using Welsh wool, um, because it had only been boiled and washed, that the, the lanolin that's in the wool was producing was enough to pass BS 177, which is the um, fire retardancy test. Meanwhile, the process continues. The covers are cut and stitched. The wool, which has been sorted into thick and thin, is combined with cotton, and the mattress is built up with layers of materials with different properties to give a combination of both support and comfort. You get a lot of people who say, oh, I'm, I've always been allergic to wool. And it's the same as a cotton T-shirt. You could look and see the label says 100% cotton. That doesn't mean there's nothing else involved in in that cotton, so you're talking about I think 16 teaspoons of chemicals going to that one t-shirt um, and a lot of people don't realise that. Abaca are very much on the organic side of the, the industry which is very unique within the UK. Um, it is an area of the market which is relatively new but has a great potential for growth and also that uh, you see a lot of people with the, the chemicals used in materials and things like this, they want to move away from that, have a better living environment, and the organic bed is very much a part of that uh, world they, they're, they're, they're looking for. The final touches, the buttons, the covers. It's very much an individually made product and one that can be good for your health as well as the environment. It's the end of a long journey from the hills of Wales to high-class London shops where the Abaca mattress can retail for over £1,000. So for the last word on environmentally friendly organic bedding... The 14th century town of Castelbuono in Sicily has turned to its past to deal with its modern-day problems. It's out with the rubbish trucks and in with a band of noble donkeys to collect the city's rubbish. The town is already top of the list for recycling in Sicily and the mayor has enlisted the services of Teresa the donkey and three of her friends in the battle against pollution. We had this idea to continue along our virtuous path, to look at new initiatives even if this one is natural and practical, in order to come up with something to improve our environment. Teresa takes her job quite seriously, clopping around the town, picking up things other people don't want with her ecology box on her back. But the townsfolk are distinctly unimpressed. This just won't do. I don't agree with the donkey. We need to move forward, not backward. It's like going backwards 40 years. Most of the residents can still remember when donkeys were a common sight around town and relate those times to hardship and poverty. But Teresa's working partner thinks they're wrong. These donkeys are great. We work well together. Catalano even carries a little dustpan and brush on their rounds just in case Teresa gets caught on the hop. According to the mayor, apart from cutting down on pollution, the donkeys cost far less to run than the old rubbish trucks and can continue working for up to 15 years. And besides, who could resist a face like this? Stretching 6,000 kilometres, China's mighty Yangtze River is the world's third longest after the Nile and the Amazon. Sadly, it's also one of the dirtiest, the result of people, pollution and dams. It absorbs 40% of China's wastewater from factories, fields and city sewers that run beside it. The pollution is killing the fish and endangering the health of millions of people. 
People's awareness of the situation is rather weak. One reason is that a lot of information about water quality and pollution has not been made public. If we immediately inform them about the pollutants in the water, they would be very worried. China's environment has been a casualty of the country's rapid economic growth, with little official attention given to the problem until recently. Perhaps most vulnerable are the Yangtze's thousands of boat people who are completely dependent on the river for food and water. The pollution is much worse than it was during the 1960s through the 1980s. Now there are fewer and fewer fish, but we are not really that clear about the situation. We have to purify the water with alum in order to use it for drinking. It can't be drunk without purifying it first. Official studies reveal that the river's annual harvest of aquatic products in the 1990s was less than a quarter of that in the 1950s. Tributaries that flow into the Yangtze, like Chao Lake, contribute to the problem. Rimmed with factories and fields that use chemical fertilizers, it's one of the most polluted places in China. Every spring, fishermen at Chao Lake are required by environmental laws to halt fishing for a few months. During this time, they repair their nets and worry about their diminishing livelihoods. Ordinary people like us don't understand the situation very well. But we do know that the fish don't taste as good as they used to. As for the specifics of the damage, it would need a scientific evaluation. We can't do it ourselves. City sewerage is also a serious problem. In Wuhu City, this canal sends the sewage directly into the nearby Yangtze, threatening not just the health of the river, but also the city's residents. When the weather gets hot, the smell is really bad. This wastewater is discharged all day long, without stopping. It just keeps going. China's central government is now focused on the problem, due to a series of chemical spills over the last few years, as well as preparations for a Green Olympics, but regional officials still fail to enforce regulations. The Yangtze is just one part of China's water woes. Reports state that 300 million people across the nation do not have access to drinkable water. With water an increasingly precious commodity, the humble earthworm could well prove to be an environmental hero. A chemical-free alternative to treating human and industrial waste, the worms are so effective they've joined the workforce of some of Chile's largest companies. Don Polo sells over one million chickens a month, producing large amounts of organic waste and water. Previously treated with chemicals, the farm's organic waste is now funneled into a biofilter, where hundreds of worms live alongside billions of microbes to break down the garbage. The earthworm is in charge of keeping the microbes alive and decomposing all of the organic material. All of the solid waste that comes banks up against the sawdust and the job of the earthworm is to go and break it down. They convert all of this organic material into humus, which is an excellent fertiliser. The biofilter is a pool with several separate layers. Solid waste is placed on the top and then dirty water from the plant is sprayed down from above to create a sludge. The earthworms and the microbes eat their way through it, by which time it is divided into clean water and harmless organic fertilizer. First of all, it helps on the environmental side. And secondly, we have got rid of all of the chemical side. We filter the water in subterranean channels, but that is now not a problem. Biofilters work quickly, and because the earthworms and microbes reproduce, the system constantly maintains itself. This system helps us look after our whole environment, especially the waterways. To start off with, all the industries in Chile, when environmental laws didn't exist, weren't looking after them. Without someone telling them to look after the waterways, they didn't. 
Now, with all of the environmental laws, companies have had to go and implement systems in order to comply with the law. We help in some way with complying with these laws and reducing costs, and that is the goal of this system. Biofilters are now being used at over 50 companies in Chile, Paraguay and New Zealand. At Jucasol, a Chilean juice company, earthworms and microbes munch through the waste from 300,000 tonnes of grapes each year. This is the water entering the biofilter with all of the contamination from the factory. And this is the water that is coming out of the system. Although not drinking quality, the treated water is clean enough to release into natural water systems or for industrial purposes, with 96% of harmful contaminants removed. The United States government estimates that Americans generate more than 3 million tonnes of electronic waste every year. There are toxic materials in computers and other kinds of electronics, mercury, cadmium, lead, and the flame retardants that they put into the computers to keep them from catching fire are all quite toxic. So putting them out into landfills can lead to those chemicals, those toxins getting into the environment, getting into our lives. By the time that it gets to the landfill, it's probably dumped in a truck, it may already be broken, any kind of uh, materials may already be released. So it's much, much more efficient to, to work on education, regulation, legislation, partnerships, all of those things that encourage and allow us to separate those materials before they ever get in that trash truck. Increasingly, consumers are becoming more aware of the need for safe disposal of their unwanted electronics, and many small private firms now offer computer recycling services to meet this growing need. On the outskirts of Springfield, Missouri, an e-waste recycling centre charges a fee of between $5 and $25 for equipment to be recycled, everything from computer mice to televisions and their remote controls. Talking about e-waste, a lot of the items are throwaway items. They're just made for a year, two years, and then they're discarded. And unfortunately, we live in a throwaway society. And the e-waste can be properly recycled. It can be, if done correct. Now, the profit margin isn't that big in this type of business, but uh, it, it can be a profitable business. Well, I think one area that needs, that, that's getting attention, and I think we'll see increasingly, is better design of electronics so that toxics are reduced and so they're made more effectively for recycling. And that's an area where we're emphasizing now as well as others, and so I, we definitely expect to see that more. There are models where the producer of the electronics is responsible for its final disposal. So what happens there is that people who build a computer start designing it in a way that it's easy to take apart and recover those um, useful materials and get rid of the materials that are really garbage. Four U.S. states already control the dumping of e-waste. Twenty other states are considering introducing similar legislation. If you care about the health of your children and future generations, if you care about wildlife, if you care about making sure there's enough land for um, parks and open space and things that we want to see, then um, you need to be part of the solution. <laughs> Rising 108 metres above sea level, these wind turbines are the very visible face of Britain's first offshore commercial wind farm, powering over 30,000 homes. Located three kilometres off the coast of Great Yarmouth, the massive turbines can be seen several miles away. Making use of the more powerful and reliable wind forces at sea, British power company E.ON plans another, larger farm. It's something that E.ON is, is taking very seriously and we're developing, we have, developing a, a range of uh, renewables technologies both uh, in terms of wind onshore and offshore and uh, this project will be one of the, the largest um, 
offshore wind farms in the UK. We're looking for um, construction over a two-year period uh, following planning consent. So we're hopeful that we would get the first generation, first renewable generation um, in 2012. The new wind farm is to be built off the east coast of England at the mouth of the river Humber. It will comprise up to 83 of the largest existing turbines, generating 300 megawatts at peak output, enough to supply the electricity needs of 200,000 homes. But constructing turbines offshore brings many engineering challenges, not least the need to anchor the massive towers, weighing hundreds of tonnes, to withstand the fiercest storms imaginable. The design, construction and maintenance of the wind farms draws upon some of the specialist skills built up over 40 years as British businesses service the offshore oil and gas rigs in the North Sea. The shift to renewable energy sources, such as wind power, is in line with the UK government's targets to reduce carbon emissions 60% by the year 2050. We're not only talking about uh, wind farms. E.ON is, for example, is constructing in Scotland at the moment um, the, what will be the largest UK biomass um, be, uh, fueled power station. Uh, we're also very active in developing marine devices. We have a, a team that are looking to put in into the sea both tidal and uh, wave devices. The new wind farm will save up to 700,000 tonnes of CO2 a year and is expected to be generating power by 2012. Join us again when we bring you more of what matters to keep our world green.